Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming along to this talk in the series this evening. Um, my name is Heidi McIlvenny. I'm the Marine Conservation Manager at Ulster Wildlife. And I'm going to be talking all about our native oysters and Ulster Wildlife's latest marine conservation project. Uh, but before we jump into that, there's a couple of housekeeping um, things I wanted to mention. So first off, I'm, I'm recording the talk so that it is available to watch for other members who couldn't make it tonight to watch later. So if you don't want to be captured in the video, please keep your camera off. Um, I'll probably be, be talking for like between 20, 25 minutes, I think. So there'll be plenty of time for us to chat and um, answer any questions afterwards. Um, but I can't see anyone um, when I share my screen like this. I can only see my presentation. Um, so if you want to ask a question during the talk, um, please just unmute your mic and um, interrupt me and ask your question. Um, as much interaction as possible during the talk would be great. Um, otherwise, you can just pop uh, um, any comments or questions into the chat function, and then we can, at the end of the presentation, uh, go through that and answer those questions. Um, so if you're not asking me a question, please make sure you stay muted. Otherwise, you can get weird sort of feedback and background noise. Um, and I think that's us. Uh, we're ready to get started. So I hope you enjoy the talk. Okay. So oysters, the theme of the talk tonight. Um, some people absolutely love oysters, but I find, you know, through doing um, this project that it's one of the foods that can prompt the strongest reaction in people. Some people will look at this plate of oysters, you know, be salivating over the creamy oysters in their half shells and others will literally be recoiling at the thought of having to eat something that's so snot-like and gooey. <laughs> So first of all, I wanted to get a bit of a sense of how much oysters play a part in your guys' diets at the moment. Um, and we have a poll function in Zoom. So Erin, if you're able to launch the poll, the question should pop up on everyone's screen. Um, the answers are totally anonymous throughout the whole uh, talk. So um, no one's going to know what you've answered. Oh, they're coming in thick and fast. Sometimes on special occasions. Some people haven't had the opportunity to try them. Lots. Some people just saying absolutely no way. Okay, that seems to be most of the answers three. Most people answered. Okay, so what's coming out the most um, popular answer is that sometimes you eat them on special occasions, which makes sense. Um, it's kind of how they are part of our culture at the moment. And I'll get into that a bit more. I'm going to talk about the history of oysters um, in Northern Ireland. So how did I get the poll to go away? There we go. Okay, so most um, of the oysters on sale and eaten in the UK are actually Pacific oysters. And this is an invasive species. It was brought here intentionally though, um, for the purposes of aquaculture, whenever our native oyster species um, declined and sort of disappeared. Um, and they're quite easy to tell apart, the, our native species and the specific oyster. You can tell mainly by their shape. So next time you're eating oysters, You'll be able to figure out what uh, species it is. The Pacific oysters generally are much longer. Often they're teardrop shaped but they can kind of grow in all sorts of bendy directions. Got quite a rough surface with um, those purplish bands that you can see on the top valve there. They can grow for you know about 20 years or more, but generally when they're harvested um, for food, you know, in restaurants and stuff, they're between 18 and, and 36 months um, old. So they originally came from Southeast Asia 
cultivated a lot in Japan, but in the 70s, they were brought over to Northern Ireland for agriculture. And now most of the Pacific oyster farms uh, source their seed from France. So the hatchery seed is grown in mesh bags on metal trestles. But the seed is uh, bred in a way so that it won't impact or is not supposed to impact on our native species. So they're what the seed is what's called triploid meaning that they're sterile. Um, but this isn't completely fail safe because we do have some issues or, and we can see now that the Pacific oyster is starting to appear in parts of the locks where it shouldn't. Our native oysters um, are much more round and they're also sometimes called Europe European flat oyster. But you can see in the pictures here, they're much more circular. And they're also a slightly different color. They're kind of yellowy, creamy, sometimes almost greeny looking. And one valve or one side of the shell is concave and fixed to the substratum. And then the other one sort of fits nicely and neatly on top. And it's quite interesting in your poll results, you know, the most popular answer there was that you sometimes eat them on special occasion. I think that reflects how we um, see oysters now. They're sort of a food that's considered to be quite fancy or, you know, high decadent kind of food that you would eat with champagne. But if you look back 200 years ago, they were handed out as free bar snacks. Um, skip that. So up until you know, the 19th century really, oysters remained a really popular food because they were available to all sort of segments of our society. In wealthy houses, they'd cook oysters or prepare oysters in pies and put them in birds or simply eat them raw. But they were also sold as street food. This picture is an illustration from a comic published in 1835, and it is a depiction of Oyster Day in London. So you can see that the oysters are being sold on the street here. You also have little kids using the oyster shells to beg uh, for money from this man. And then this little kid is just having fun making a little grotto out of all the empty oyster shells that just sort of littered the street. So there's been a real shift in um, how oysters are playing a part in our diet. Um, in Northern Ireland, we had many thriving oyster fisheries in most of our locks. Um, in Belfast Lock, we had a native oyster fishery that was thriving in the 1700s. And we have a report um, from 17 hundreds sort of detailing and um, the number of oysters that were being dredged up but in this report you can see that there's there's already a decline so even in the 1800s we're starting to see how our native oyster populations are not doing so well and um, this report showed that in the 1800s boats could dredge you know nearly a thousand oysters a day and they would sell them for four to seven shillings for a hundred oysters. By 1819, so less than 20 years later, boats were going out and only able to dredge up, um, you know, 200, 300 oysters a day. And then they were selling them for twice as much, eight to 18 shillings. So there was a big decline in how many oysters were actually available. And then the price was going up. So they weren't they they weren't um, accessible and available to all parts of our society anymore. And then by 1903, that fishery officially closed because it just wasn't functional anymore. So fishing it has been the main threat to our oyster populations. It's not the only problem. Sort of around the same time, you had more and more people moving to our coastline, and um, which meant you know more sewage ending up in our dumped in our seas, just increasing the prevalence of diseases. But we can sort of clearly link it here um, to overfishing um, a few hundred years ago being the driver of the decline. Uh, this just highlights the same sort of information from the other locks. Um, 
both Larne Lock, Strangford Lock and Carlingford Locks had, you know, good, good native oyster fisheries, which have all since closed. Um, Larne Lock as early as 1883, the others in 1903, the same as Belfast Lock. Lock Foyle is a little different. Um, there's been a, a native oyster fishery there since 1436, and it's one of the last remaining wild native oyster fisheries in the UK and Europe. So this decline in our native oysters um, wasn't specific to Northern Ireland or even the UK. In fact, we've lost um, our native oyster species um, around it's throughout its range. So it's estimated that we've lost 95% across the UK and Ireland, and this is about 85% across um, the world. If we zoom in on the UK and Ireland on this map here, you can see that the colors around our islands are red, the red and burgundy, which means that um, the native oysters are either in very, very poor condition or they're at this point functionally extinct. And what happened when we lost our native oysters was not just a loss of a food source or even of one species, but we also lost all of those ecosystem services or benefits um, that native oysters provide. So, for example, if you have healthy oyster um, populations, then they actually form reefs kind of like in this picture, how they grow on top of each other and create this 3D complex kind of system. And that means there's lots of spaces and nooks and crannies, which provide a home and shelter for lots of other marine wildlife and, and little baby fish that can live in there. So once you know that was dredged away and disappeared, then so was that habitat for um, the amazing biodiversity that oyster reefs can support. They are also incredible at filtering water. In fact, they can filter, one oyster can filter about 240 liters of um, water in one day. That's about the amount of water in your bathtub. So it's quite significant. And you can see in this time-lapse, I'll pause it, that over just the course of a few hours, the tank with the oysters in it on the left has really made that water a lot clearer compared to the tank on the right. And that's because they're filter feeders. So they're sucking in the water and passing it through their gills and they're feeding on all the little particles of zooplankton and phytoplankton and algae um, to eat, which means that our water is a lot clearer. And that's something that as humans, we value. We want our waters to be clearer and anything that can filter out or prevent some sort of algal blooms is really beneficial and positive to us. This also has benefits for other wildlife. Um, for example, um, there's been examples where native oysters have improved the recovery of other important habitats like seagrass. And seagrass is a photosynthetic plant that lives fully submerged under the water. But because they photosynthesize, they need the light to be able to come down you know, from the sun, penetrate through the water column to them. Um, so generally they're found in shallower waters so that the light will penetrate. But if you have some sort of, um, you know, if you have too much algae in the water or something, it can block that light and, and cr create some shading. So if you have some healthy native oyster reefs nearby, they can potentially help clear the water and support the recovery of a habitat like seagrass. There we go. Um, another ecosystem service that native oyster reefs can provide is by storing and locking away carbon. So a healthy population that's forming these reefs and growing it on top of each other is going to be able to stabilize the sediment underneath. And all of that you know, sediment on our seabed is filled with carbon. And we don't want that to sort of get flushed away and move, you know, get lost in the water column. We want to lock it in. And also as they're filter feeding, they're going to be bringing in some carbon particles and storing that in their shells because their shells are made of calcium carbonate. And um, so the more um, shells that are trapped underneath the live oysters as they grow is another way of them locking away carbon. There we go. Okay, 
Um, Aaron, are you able to launch the next, the poll that's how many liters of water? So it'll come up, there's just a uh, quick thing to see if you can remember how many liters of water one oyster can filter per day. That was really fast. Everyone's <laughs> awake this evening and paying attention, which is awesome. Yeah, 240 liters. Just quite a significant amount. Um, and there's been some studies that have looked at, you know, converting that to a monetary value as well um, to really highlight the significance of it. Okay, so across Europe and across the UK and Ireland, there's been recognition of, you know, this loss um, of our native oyster habitats and species and all of the ecosystem services. Um, there's a group called NORA, the Native Oyster Restoration Alliance, that has brought together all of the organizations and projects that are trying to restore native oysters. Um, so this is just an example of seven of those projects across Europe that are working together to do this. You know, and it's a mixture of NGOs, research institutes, and um, government bodies, and oyster fishermen. And in those seven projects alone, there's a financial commitment to oyster restoration of over 17 million euros. So that's quite significant. In Ireland, there's four projects ongoing. In England, there's six, and Scotland another three, and Wales another three. So in across the UK and Ireland, and um, there's a financial commitment of over eight million pounds. But yet Northern Ireland has no active restoration, at least not registered. So we're quite far behind um, the rest of our counterparts across UK, Ireland and Europe. That is until um, we launched Ulster Wildlife's latest marine conservation project which is called a native oyster nursery. So we've partnered with Bangor Marina for this project. So I've put this beautiful picture of Bangor Marina um, where we want to deploy 24 native oyster nurseries. So on the left here, you can see a picture of what a nursery looks like. It's essentially a cage that houses 27 mature oysters and they're in quite you know, close proximity to each other in the cages. And then we hang each of these nurseries underneath the pontoons of Bangor Marina. So at the bottom of all these hammerhead pontoons. And the marina have been great. They've um, cut into the pontoons to create a little hatch that we can lift off so that we can lower the nurseries down just um, on some rope and hang them there. And it's a really good location because they're under the pontoons, which means that they're shaded from the sunlight. So they're not in direct sunlight and sort of becoming too warm. But also it's the right depth so that they can be hung off the seabed. So predators like little crabs can't get at them and eat all the oysters. Um, and this work is supported by uh, the DERA Challenge Fund. So in total, we want to um, deploy 24 of these nurseries, which means that we'll have 648 oysters in the water in, um, in total. And the idea is that these are mature oysters, so they will release larvae into the water and the tides and the currents will bring that larvae out into Belfast Lock, where hopefully it will settle out in the lock there. So these nurseries are kind of acting like a maternity ward or a larval pump, whatever your preferred um, description is, um, but they're releasing that next generation of oyster larvae into the ocean. You're probably wondering why we've done that if oysters have been extinct in Belfast Lock since 1903 when the fishery closed, but um, it's because in the summer of 2020 there was some really positive news that researchers found evidence of live native oysters in the intertidal area of Belfast Lock. And that's really positive because it means that the environmental conditions are right for them to have naturally recovered. However, the numbers were really small. So for them to actually 
properly established and for the population to increase, active intervention is going to be required. So that's why we're doing this nursery project in Belfast Lock. Um, and from all those other projects from across the UK and Europe, they've identified barriers that are you know, common across all of them really um, to oyster population recovery. The first is that there's a low number of mature reproducing oysters. So that is the case in Belfast Lock. We only have a small number. So by adding our nurseries with, and with a total of 650 odd mature reproducing oysters, we're hopefully going to be able to increase that you know, level of um, larvae going out and having the potential to settle. Also that they've been lost from living memory. So a lot of people don't realize that we should actually have native oysters in our locks. And we're hoping to be able to address that through this project too. So the fact that we have a restoration project in a marina means that it's really accessible. And Bang and Marina are open to allowing us to bring, you know, Ulster Wildlife members and schools and community groups down to actually get involved in the restoration work. So we can pull up those cages through the hatch and then volunteers can help us monitor the mortality and the biodiversity and all of those things and, and get an idea of how this project actually works. So where we're currently at with this project is that it hasn't been deployed yet, but we've had to go through a lot of licensing and permission and um, processes with DIRA and um, but they will being secured now, which is fantastic. And obviously DIRA are funding the project, so they're very supportive of it as well. Um, we have all of our nursery cages um, ready to go in the water. They were specially made by um, someone in Scotland. Um, and we, the next step is to actually go and pick up the oysters. So we are um, getting them from an oyster supplier in Loch Ryan. Now we've had to go all the way to Scotland to get our oysters because they have to come from a disease free water body. And unfortunately, um, in Loch Foyle, it's not disease free. Um, bonemia is a disease that has impacted a lot of native oyster areas. Um, but you know, some it has oysters have survived it, others, have, you know, and have developed some sort of immunity to it. And um, but it is a problem. So We've gone to Loch Ryan, that's disease free, to pick up our oysters and hopefully we'll be able to pop them in Belfast Lock. And then from there, all the fun bit starts. We get to monitor them weekly and hopefully get the marina open to volunteers who want to help us with that. And then we want to be able to build on it. So, you know, having spoken with all these projects elsewhere, um, they've done some work on modeling which is what we'd like to do in Belfast Lock so if we can get a model to you know understand the tides and the currents and the wind it can give us an idea or start to predict where our oyster larvae will settle and if we know where they're going to settle then we can survey the area to see if there's suitable substrate because oysters are kind of picky about where they settle they actually really like to grow on top of each other so what some projects have done is actually and laid down culch where they know that oysters are going to settle. So this picture on the bottom right hand corner is from the Inori project in Essex where they're laying down culch to encourage oyster settlement. So there's so much more we can do with this project once we finally got the nursery deployed. And um, so that's all for me really. Um, I'm happy to take any of your questions, but just before we do that, I wanted to just bring your attention to the next talk in the series, which is called Pine Martins and Red Squirrels, an Unlikely Ally. So it's on the 23rd of February and it's hosted by Ross, who's our Priority Species Officer. Um, I know many of the people on the talk tonight are members, so thank you so much for all of your support. Um, some people have are attending tonight and aren't members, um, but if you would like to support Ulster Wildlife's work, you can become a member by going onto our website. Um, also, all of our volunteering opportunities are on our website, and you can keep up to date with all of our work on our social medias. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on Instagram, 
and all of our events are promoted on there as well. So I'm going to stop sharing. And happy to chat. There's some things going on in the chat. Um, so if, any, if anyone's popped a question in the chat, feel free to shout it out now if you're interested, or I can just work my way through it. Um, I saw a few, Heidi, if you want me just to relay them back to you. Um, yeah, that would be great. Some I think you've answered already. Uh, a few people were curious about where you sourced the adult oysters from. Yep, yeah, so we're sourcing them from Loch Ryan. And um, there's a producer there and he has also, I think, provided oysters for the other nursery projects. So this methodology has been done elsewhere. There's a nursery in Conway Bay in Wales in the Firth of Clyde in Scotland and Tyne and Ware in England. And those projects are run by the Zoological Society of London and Blue Marine. Um, and they've had some really successful um, results of their projects because you know lots of people have been able to come down and get involved but when they've been doing the biodiversity monitoring they find some really cool things um, like uh, sea scorpion fish, uh, European eels which are endangered have been found living in and around the nurseries and various nudibranchs and butterfish um, so hopefully we'll get the same kind of results as them. Amazing um, and just one through from Patrick as well that says at the end, you mentioned what sounded like clutch. Is that basically stones? Um, uh, it's culch, C-U-L-T-C-H. And it's dried uh, shells basically. So you can, you know, if you're able to collect empty oyster shells from restaurants, dry them out for a year, and then you lay that on the seabed and that'll encourage them. There's been loads of um, different tests on you know what kind of substrate they prefer and they will settle on you know scallop shells and things like that but I think they really prefer just growing on top of themselves. Okay amazing good to know and then um, one final one it looks like from Richard which says do the commercial oyster beds pose a challenge to seeding native oysters in terms of location or by hosting parasites? Um, not in Belfast Lock because there isn't a commercial fishery for native oysters and um, not anymore anyways and um, the only place really in Northern Ireland is the foil so we probably you know we wouldn't set up a project in the foil that was purely for conservation purposes there are models of other projects that are in partnership with oyster fishermen and um, what is it the yeah so that the Inori project in Essex is in partnership with oyster fishermen so they have created a, a marine protected area specifically for the native oysters and a portion of that um your the oyster fishermen are allowed to fish sustainably so they're trying to figure out you know how what is sustainable in terms of numbers so that model is out there it's not what we're doing in Belfast Lock because we're just trying to get and um, the very precarious population that's there to sort of establish and become stronger and healthier. Um, in terms of parasites, that's a good question. I don't really know. I know disease seems to be the main um, problem. So at the minute we know Belfast Lock, well, we don't know. Supposedly Belfast Lock is disease free, but the problem with that is they're not testing it because there's no oysters in the lock. But if we bring really healthy oysters over, we know they're disease free and um, if they end up getting it, it's, it will have spread from, you know, Strangford or the foil. Amazing. Yeah, a good bit of discussion about um, parasites and then also someone just asking, do we have many problems with any other invasive species or anything else that would predate on the oysters? Yeah, um, Crepidula, which is um, also sort of commonly called a slipper limpet is an invasive species and it does compete with our native oyster and also they can um, feed on them and um, they can drill into the, the shells and eat the oysters so that is going to be a challenge um, I know the department does capitula surveys 
um, subtitly and then through our Shore and I project, um, which is a, a big group of volunteer citizen scientists who are, you know, out surveying the intertidal area. Um, so sometimes they pick up slipper limpet. So I think it'll be really key to keep track of where it's spreading because it could become um, a problem for our native oysters. Perfect. Um, we've definitely started conversations. There's a few more questions filtering through, um, but let me know how you're doing for time because I'm sure we can get uh, email addresses and stuff sent through, but if you're happy um, enough to answer a few more. Yeah, of course. Um, we've got one from David, which said uh, native oysters, but the map covered the whole world. What is the definition or is it all the same species? Um, no, so the native oysters are, have a range around Europe. Um, the other parts of the map were representing their native species, if that makes sense. So it was kind of showing um, generally oyster habitat degradation as opposed to specifically for our native oyster, the European flat oyster. Um, but there were there's two references on that map, so I can go back to the papers and, and clarify that a bit if um, David wanted to. Perfect. Um, and then just some chats about um, the pressure that dredging presents and if that will be uh, limited or kind of cut back in any way here to enable reefs to form and grow again. Um, so dredging for oysters um, in terms of fishing isn't happening um, and I doubt that you know it would be a long time for native oysters um, to become you know reef forming again and, and to actually support a fishery but in Belfast Lock there's obviously a lot of dredging for the harbour and also for the marina and shipping channels and stuff um, that would create a pressure in terms of sedimentation. So you could essentially kind of suffocate the oysters. Um, so we have got plans that whenever the marina has to be dredged, we, we move the oysters elsewhere for that period of time to protect them. And um, we haven't had those conversations yet, or I haven't even explored what the potential consequences of you know, dredging in, the, in Belfast Harbour or something, for example, could have on them. The next step is to figure out where the larvae is settling. And then once we know that, we'll be able to identify what pressures might be in that specific area to impact them. Perfect. Um, and then we've also just got some discussions about um, non-native oyster farms and if there's anything that can be done to kind of encourage those farms to use native oysters instead, or would this be a real difficult challenge to overcome? Yeah, um, so I think there's probably a question of economics there because my understanding is you can grow a Pacific oyster to, to, to market size a lot quicker than you can with a native oyster. Um, so that might play a part in maybe how much you can produce or how quickly. Um, also, I, how you farm them is slightly different. So the Pacific oysters kind of go in those mesh bags on these trestles on the foreshore. I don't think that works for native oysters. If you're going to farm them, they need to be on a hard substrate. So potentially there's questions around the infrastructure. Um, I think our focus is trying to bring back the reefs and all of those other ecosystem services. And yes, providing sustainable fisheries is one of those, but it's maybe it's it's not the focus of our project at the minute. Um, so yeah, it, it would be interesting to find out a bit more about the wild native oyster fishery in Loch Foyle to see you know, how sustainable that is. It's been going for a long time, so it must be managed quite well. Fantastic. And then just a few um, questions about the larvae itself. One being, um, how long does it take to mature? And the other, how can we track the larvae when it enters Belfast Lock to find out where it's settling? Um, so to track it is someone with a bigger brain than me 
um, does a lot of the modeling work. So if you can kind of put together what we know about the currents and the tides and the wind, and then you, you couple that with um, the po population dynamic information, and then you're kind of able to estimate where that is. Um, we have on, a, on sort of a, a side project to this, we are working with David Smith from the University of Bangor, who is a native oyster expert, and he is doing that exact thing in Strangford Lock. So he's trying to figure out, um, would it be possible to, to do some restoration in Strangford Lock using sink source dynamics? So if you protect your source, you know, you have a really healthy population here, and you predict where they move, how can we keep you know, improving the habitat in the next place that they're going to settle. If that makes sense. Sorry, what was the first part of that question? Um, also, how long the larvae take to mature? Uh, um, I'm not entirely sure um, what size they are. So I know that once they release the, the larvae, they have seven to like 10 days. Um, before they actually settle. So in that period when they're kind of being carried around, um, they're called larvae. And then at one stage, they're called a pedivillager, I can't say it, which means it basically grows a little foot. Um, and then that little foot sort of attaches onto the bit of rock. Um, and then they become spat. So that's like tiny, tiny little oysters that are really, really fragile. Um, and then that kind of grows, I, I think, probably about two to three years by the time they're mature. Um, but they can then live up to be about 20 years, you know, if nothing happens to them. Perfect. And I think this is uh, maybe one of the last questions that uh, hasn't had any more come through, but it's just, would uh, the oyster reefs help inshore fishery, inshore fish, example, flatfish, ray, skates make more of a return? Yeah, I definitely think there's a connection because when we're talking about sharks and skates and rays, they're really almost at the top of the food web or top predators. So they need to have healthy um, sort of trophic levels underneath them. So what they prey on, their fish and, and shellfish sources needs to be abundant. Um, and I'm sure a lot of skate species would probably feed on things like oysters if they were available. Um, so I think it's all connected and there's definitely, um, you know, an enhanced native oyster race, I'm sure would have positive benefits on our shark and ray populations. Perfect. Um, I think you answered pretty much everything there at the moment. Uh, that seems to be all the questions ticked off. So thank you. Cool. Um, that's brilliant. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, hopefully next time I get to talk to you about this, we'll actually have oysters in the water and I'll be able to show you all the pictures and show you all the marine life that's swimming around them. Or maybe one day you'll join me actually down on the marina. Um, but hopefully you've enjoyed that. And oh, somebody's, Maria's asking about taste. Oh. Um, I've never, <laughs> I've never, <laughs> I'm one of those people, one of those people that thinks that they were there snotty like snotty like there is a difference there is a difference case, but i'm not but sure i'm not sure um what it would be to be honest um but i'd recommend maybe going to a restaurant and trying both and comparing them yourself all right well thank you so much everybody for coming today and asking all your questions um i hope you enjoyed it and see you at the next talk with ross <laughs>